from, from Egypt, spiritually speaking, and not just to uh, be saved from the judgment and saved from the slavery of Egypt and start walking with him on a wilderness journey. He wants us to go in uh, to a land, uh, spiritually speaking. And uh, I gave you three words for that land. The land is, um, uh, Joshua tells us, is a land of victory and inheritance and rest. And these are spiritual ideas, uh, but God wants to save us from bondage and from slavery and take us into victory, inheritance and rest. And I believe that's a, a current reality, or should be a current reality. It's what God wants for us uh, every single day of our journey with him, to be saved from slavery and bondage, uh, slavery and judgment, and taken into victory, inheritance, and rest. Uh, so what a fantastic journey. What a fantastic, um, if you like, picture of salvation this is. And this is the, the Exodus journey from Egypt to the land. Uh, but right in the middle of that, interestingly, is the book of Leviticus. And uh, you think, well, I, I get the big picture. I get, I get the salvation story. But, I mean, Leviticus is just lost on me. Uh, how can I understand that? And how can I un understand it particularly in our uh, current generation? It seems so distant to us and so ancient and so primitive uh, and it's just beyond me uh, to, how, uh, to understand whether it has any spiritual significance for me today. Uh, but, but if it's true that the Exodus journey is a great picture of salvation, then surely God has put Leviticus in the middle for a reason. And uh, it's, it's the very heart of that salvation story. And uh, God is saying, how, how can I change slaves, you know, in, in Egypt to, to saints who are fit for the land? How, how is that transformation possible? Or put it another way, how can I make prisoners into priests? And the book of Leviticus is given to us to actually tell us how God does that. Uh, so, I believe Leviticus is a, a transformational mechanism, if you like, God's transformation process to change um, slaves to saints. And um, knowing the challenge that we have as God's people, um, being changed, you know, actually transformed, then surely the book of Leviticus is going to be helpful in that. Uh, but if, if we're going to, if you like, reap its blessing, we must understand the way it's written and uh, its theological um, framing so that we can receive uh, the uh, teaching, if you like, the instructions of God uh, for our current uh, generation. So, uh, a transformational journey. And uh, I believe uh, it's bedded there in the, in the middle of, if you like, the big picture of a journey, salvation, as a little picture uh, that speaks of my um, entrance into God's presence and the transformation that comes by coming face to face with God himself. And then moving out from that with, if you like, the light of God shining uh, in my face uh, to, to live in a real world having been touched by God himself. And so in the second uh, week, we, we looked at Leviticus as a book. And uh, you've got the picture there um, on, on the front page. Um, the book has actually got um, eight parts to it, uh, eight uh, sections. And they're, they're all on this journey, uh, but a journey not from uh, Egypt to the land, but a journey within a sanctuary. And so uh, Leviticus is like a, a textual sanctuary, if you follow that. And as you, as you read through Leviticus, you're reading through the sections of the sanctuary. 
and uh, you, you need to sort of have that in your head as you're reading. So there's eight parts, and uh, uh, it's in two halves, if you like. Um, the central part, I've got there in yellow, is the, the centre of the, the sanctuary. It's the innermost chamber of the sanctuary. It's where you get to furthest, if you like, and the Ark of the Covenant. And so uh, we, you walk, if you like, in through the sanctuary into God's presence, uh, where you hear his voice say, be holy, because I am holy. And that's there in the centre of the book in chapter 19. And then you move from there, if you like, you turn around and you go back out through the same uh, sections of the sanctuary to then live in a real world, having been touched by God's presence. But there's one other part that you need to sort of see as a bit strange, and that's the bit that's in grey, and uh, it's labelled there as the veil, and it's chapter 13 to 15 in the book. And uh, if you try and read this book, uh, you know, of any of the parts, probably this is the weirdest part. You know, this is the <coughs> hardest part. And uh, it deals with this subject of uncleanness. Uh, you know, touching things which are unclean and being affected by, um, if you like, diseases in the world, whether it's on my garments or on my skin itself or even on my house. And uh, it uses the word in the Old English of leprosy for this word. It's obviously not leprosy, because leprosy wouldn't cover all those sorts of diseases. But it is, as you and I appreciate, leprosy is a picture of sin. And so this, this is a picture of the, the, the diseases in our world that can affect our lives, and can affect our, our life for God, our walk with God. And this uh, needs to be addressed. Um, but that, that is... In, in this picture is being used to represent the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. And uh, there's a, a verse which I'd like us to read uh, right now, which uh, might help with this uh, in Hebrews chapter 10. So if you look at Hebrews 10, and uh, it's verse 19 and 20, Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, and it says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that's through the veil in, in this context, through the veil, that is his body. And since we have a great uh, priest over the house of God, let's draw near to God with a sincere heart. And basically, this, this veil is an expression of the if you like, the body of Christ, but the, the humanity of Christ in which he came, the incarnation of Christ in our world, and by which he brought about our atonement. Uh, so his body is being used here in this, in this verse to, to represent the, the, the atoning work of Christ done in his body. And so we're able to enter now into the most holy place because of Christ, uh, because of his incarnation, because of his death on the cross, because of his atonement, uh, because of his body, we're able now to go right into the holiest place of all. And the reason for that is because Christ, in his body, took all our sin. And the Bible says he became sin so that we, through his um, right, uh, so because of his sin, we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Christ's body has borne our sin and, and taken it away. And uh, in this picture, therefore, we're, we're using that um, section there to represent, if you like, that the sin of the world that's been laid on Christ and has now been taken away through his death. And of course, if you read the Gospels, uh, you'll read uh, both Matthew, Mark and Luke uh, tell of the veil of the temple being torn in two from top to bottom uh, when Christ died. Do you remember that? And you think, well, what's the significance of that? Well, well, this is the significance of it. That when Christ died, he, he took our sin upon himself and he, he took the judgment of God. And um, because that sin is taken out, if you like, from God's presence and out, outside the camp and outside, and it's it burned in the wilderness outside the camp, it's removed forever. 
And I believe when Christ died, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom as a, as a symbol, as a picture again of that way that's now been made through Christ's death. And so in your imagination, I want you to take away the veil. We're not going to deal with that um, in any way. There's enough in Leviticus without that. And so the picture on page two is the same picture, but without the veil. Uh, now, we're not getting rid of bits of the Bible. I'd, I'd be happy to sort of spend another series talking about uh, Leviticus 13 to 15. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to remove the veil for this uh, simple purpose so that we can see uh, the image of the tabernacle laid out in the book of Leviticus. And can you see now it's perfectly symmetrical? Uh, the first section is the first um, section of the tabernacle, which is uh, the court. The next section is the holy place. The third section is the holy of holies. And then the middle of the middle of the middle is the Ark of the Covenant. And then you turn around and then you go back out through the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and the court and the land, in effect, out into a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, you might think that this is, this is beyond imagination, that a writer, an ancient writer, could have written, you know, a book like Leviticus and had in his head the tabernacle as he was writing it. Uh, but I, I believe that's true. And I believe it, it makes sense as you read it in this way. And uh, if you look at the units, unit one uh, there, unit four, and unit 10, they're the, the top three units in the first three sections. In unit one, you're in the court with the altar and all the sacrifices. In unit four, you've got the priests and they, they, they go into the sanctuary for the first time in chapter nine, which we've read in the reading tonight. And then in unit 10 is the day of atonement when for the first time in the book, Aaron actually goes inside the veil into the Holy of Holies. Okay, can you see that? So as you're reading through the book, you're reading in through these uh, separate sections. Uh, but, but what then are all the other units? Do you see it? It's easy to say that there's some units like this. Why, why, why is there so much here? And so much that appears to be um, strangely connected, you know, uh, uh, sections that don't seem to fit together. Uh, so we have here uh, the, the proposal that the Book of Leviticus isn't just a, a horizontal journey. You know, you're going uh, into the court with the sacrifices, the altar, and then you're going into the holy place. There's the, there's the, the lampstand on your left-hand side, and there's the table of showbread on the right-hand side. And there's the, the place where only the priests can go. And then you go through the veil into the holiest of all. And this is God's Shekinah glory uh, over the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, you hear him say those words, be holy uh, because I am holy. So you're on this journey. Uh, but it's not just a horizontal journey. There's a two-dimensional journey in this book of Leviticus. So it's not just horizontal, it's vertical as well. And I believe every one of those sections has got three parts to it. And so you've got unit one, and unit two, and unit three. They're all part of the, the court, the court theology, if you like. And you come into the court, and the first unit is upward-oriented. It's, it's sacrifices, offerings, that are all for God and for his pleasing. And then there's a lower unit, a downward unit, if you like, that's about mundane matters, people, priests, and the people's gifts to the priest to sustain the priests. And it's practical stuff. It's everyday stuff. It's, it's earthly stuff. And then there's a between unit. And uh, if you look at uh, the drawing on page four, uh, you can see the three units laid out 
on page four. <clears throat> the first unit, the above unit, we dealt with last week, and uh, I'm going to go over it just briefly, and maybe we can stop a moment to ask how this comes across to you. The first unit, unit one, is chapter one to three, and it's got three offerings in it. The first one is called, the, in the old language, the burnt offering. But I told you it's the word Ola in Hebrew. And Ola means upward or ascending. And it's the upward offering. And it's the first thing in the book of Leviticus. And if you, if you notice where it is in the book of Leviticus, it's upward. <laughs> Do you see the first... The first offering, the first paragraph, the first chapter in the book is about an upward thing. And it's, it's the upward offering and it's all laid on the altar and it all goes up to God. So it's the one offering that is totally consumed. It's all for God. What an amazing thing that is. And uh, of course, it, it must have meant a lot to the ancient worshipper. Even, you know, before Christ... The ancient worshipper would have taken this offering and it would have been laid on the altar and it would have all gone up. The, the offer had nothing from it. The priest had nothing from it. It was all for God. And you think that's amazing that this, this is a picture to them that my relationship with God, God's relationship with me, is based on a sacrifice that's all for God. And uh, that would have maybe been all they understand or understood of it. Uh, but today, of course, we know that that speaks of Christ. That all the sacrifices, the offerings speak of Christ. And you know that Christ came and his every thought, his every word, his every action was all for God. And he went to the cross and he gave his all for God. When Christ died... He, Christ died for his father. Christ died for his father. He died for his glory, for his honor. And uh, we so often think about it as for our sin, and of course it was. But first and foremost, Christ was doing it for his father. It was all for him. So the burnt offering is speaking of Christ like this. And uh, what a wonderful expression of worship that is uh, but the third offering and I'm using this picture it's the lower of the three by lower I don't mean worse it was it was the one to do with the offerer himself and it was called the peace offering or the the well-being offering and uh, the offerer brought this offering and it was mainly for the offerer uh, the, the, the the offering itself didn't go on on the um, altar. The only thing that went on the altar was the, the fat of the innermost parts. And uh, I tried to give you a little bit of that last week. Um, uh, you tried to think again of the ancient worshipper bringing this offering. And the fat for the innermost parts were taken and they were laid, in fact, on the burnt offering. So the fat from the peace offering, from the well-being offering, was laid on the burnt offering. And if you've ever put fat on the fire, or butter on the fire, or oil on the fire, it goes, it burns up with a zealous flame. And uh, this, is, this is a picture of the, the innermost being of the peace offering was laid on the altar, and it went up with zeal for God. And uh, again, this offering speaks of Christ. Christ is our peace. He's the one that gives us peace with God and peace with others. He's the one that brings us into relationship like we so yearn. And, uh, of course, Christ in his innermost being was fat for God. Uh, it's a biblical metaphor. It, it means he was rich for God. His innermost being was rich for God. And it was laid on the altar and it went up as a sweet smell. Uh, to God. And of course that, that we, we take that offering and the offerer took it away and the offerer would eat it with his family. And of course that, that speaks to us that 
because of Christ's death, and because he is our peace offering, and because he gives us peace with God, uh, we can have the peace of God in our lives, and the peace of God with others. And so the, the offerer was able to enjoy communion, not just with God, but with others, uh, because of this offering. So that was the, the upper one, is the Ola, all for God. The lower one was all for the offerer, mainly for the offerer. And the middle one was the fine flower offering, and this was in chapter 2. And this was for the priest, mainly for the priest. A handful went on the altar for God with the oil and the frankincense, and it went up as a sweet smell to God. Uh, and the, the rest was eaten by the priest. Why the priest? Because the priest ministers, he mediates in the middle, doesn't he? Between God and humans. And so the three offerings in the first unit are laid out in the same way that the whole of the book is laid out. There's an above and a below and a middle. And they're speaking to us of this relationship that we can have with God. But each one of these three offerings were, were called pleasing aromas. So the Ola was a pleasing aroma. The fine flower was a pleasing aroma. And the, the, the peace offering was a pleasing aroma. They all speak of Christ. And they all speak of my worship of Christ being given to God. And they're, they're like a sweet aroma going up to him. And what a beautiful picture that is of genuine worship. And so I, I told you last week that quotation that I had. What is worship? Worship is the, the giving of Christ to God. It's the bringing of my appreciation of Christ to God. My appreciation of him as the the Ola, you know, wholly devoted to his father. My appreciation of him as fine flower and my appreciation of him as the peace offering, all for God. And uh, I believe a great thing to memorize is what is worship. Worship is the, the bringing of Christ to God, my appreciation of him. Uh, let me just stop a moment and... Uh, See if this is making sense to you. Are there any comments on what I've said so far? I'm always trying to cover ground. And this is what we dealt with last week mainly, so I've just sort of revised over it, and uh, we can go on from there. So any, any things you'd like to comment on uh, from what I've been saying here? Um, Jonathan, could I have a glass of water? And it's not only that comment about the fact that we tend to concentrate on the fact that Christ's offering was for us, which it was, but it was also for God. Yeah, yeah. That's so important, isn't it? Yes, yeah, beautiful, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Genesis 22, where he talks about the father and the son, you know, Abram and Isaac going to, to the sacrifice, you know, um, where he was going to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. And it, it's the first time, as you know, that there's the use of the word worship in the Bible. And that this is an amazing picture of worship. But it says there, they went, both of them, together. What a beautiful picture. The father and the son, you know, going up that mountain, both of them together. And uh, I believe on the cross, there was father, son, and Holy Spirit involved in our atonement. A beautiful picture there. I think... Or we, we become too literal yeah. in the way we approach these things, almost too logical really. We miss the um, importance of uh, how, they, how, how the original worship is saw this, yeah. saw this because they thought completely differently yes, in yeah. a different way to us. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I do believe, it, it, I, I, I hope I'm trying to you know, convince you that actually every single one of these chapters, you know, I, I could take the burnt offering, we could spend a whole night on the burnt offering. Every single detail of the burnt offering 
we could look at it and say, in what sense is this like Christ, you know? And I, I believe it's, it's a rich, rich mine of the essence of worship. And so if you meditate on Christ as the bird offering and you, you, you get that in your head and you use that in your worship, you know, and then do the same with the fine flower offering, you know, it's Christ. Think about Christ in that way. And then the peace offering. Think about Christ in that way. Oh, I found hours and hours of enjoyment um, thinking on that. So don't, don't run away from them. Enjoy the metaphor. It's a metaphor. It's a picture. But it worked for them, I believe, did you say. I, I think they understood the basic essence of the metaphor, what they were doing. And the same is true for us. But of course it's Christ. Just changes the way you, you read Leviticus, doesn't it? Yeah. The temptation is to, to rush through it because yeah. I think it's just a lot of repetition. And yeah. Yeah. But actually, yeah, as you say, it's. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Okay, so we, we dealt with the first unit last week. Uh, and I, I'm showing you here now that the first section in the chord is actually three units. And the, the upper unit, which I've coloured in blue to give that sort of heavenly sense, um, is also three layers. It's, it's an upward offering, a lower offering, you know, to do with the offerer, and it's to do with the priest in the middle. So it's also oriented in the same way. But the, the upper unit is all for God, it's for his pleasure, for his glory. And I did say last week, I, I want you in your worship uh, to try and get to that place where um, our worship is not just about our sin. You know, when we come to praise God, give thanks to God, it's not necessarily focused on our sin. And th these three offerings aren't focused on our sin. They're, they're all for God's glory. They're all about Christ. And they're all to please the Father's heart. God delights in his Son. God delights in his Son. And so if I delight in his Son, I delight the Father's heart. This is, this is the essence of the first three offerings, the upward offerings. Uh, but there's a middle, do you see the, the between? Um, and this is about sin. And can you see, um, maybe if we just look at the below first, so you can see the contrast. The below is about the priests, about the, the processes the priests have to follow in doing the offerings and the portion that they have from the offering. And if you think you are now a priest in this picture, and you are now going to be bringing offerings where well, you need to know how to worship. And maybe this is a sort of bit of a workshop on worship like this to help us to be priests and to learn how to do that. So those chapters, chapter 6 and 7, again, they're hard to read. And you think, what, what use is this to me? It's about how to worship. Uh, but also you'll see frequently it uses words like portion or share or due. And the, the priests were given a portion of each of the offerings. And just as a quick aside, even the Burns offering, which I said was all for God, it's the carcass was all for God. But they did skin it. And who had the skin? Well, of course, the priests had the skin. How were priests clothed? They were clothed in Christ. You know, that's the truth of it. The skin from the Ola, the skin from the burnt offering that was all for God was used to clothe the priests. What an amazing picture that is. And you and I are clothed in Christ. We're clothed in his righteousness. And because Christ was the one who lived all for his father every moment of his day, that's the one that can clothe us and make us right with God. And so that, that's an example of a portion that was given to the priests. And so those chapters deal with those portions. Uh, but I want to make a practical point here. That 
What is one of the biggest things that can change your soul from being a slave in Egypt to being a saint fit for the land? What's one of the biggest things? It's, it's meditating on Christ and worshipping Christ. The more we fill our hearts and our souls and our minds with Christ, and the more we bring it as worship to God, the more we are transformed to be like him. It's mind-changing to meditate on Christ. And I, I believe that today, because our heads are so filled with other stuff, Christ is squeezed out. And God wants to fill our hearts with him. And you and I should take every opportunity, day by day, to read our, uh, his word, to fill our hearts with Christ. Spend time in God's presence with God's people to fill our hearts with Christ. And the more we fill our hearts with Christ, the more we become like Christ. And the more we have victory, inheritance, and rest in Christ. And, and that's why the lower earthly portion here is about what you give priests when you give them a portion of the offerings. That's how it feeds their souls. That's how they're sustained. That's how they're maintained, is by feeding on Christ. And I believe we need to be spiritual priests, feeding our hearts on portions of Christ. So that's the, the above, is offering to God. The lower is what's feeding the priests, if you like. What's in between? What breaks the relationship between the above and the below? It's sin, isn't it? And so it's not by chance that the middle section <coughs> here is about sin. Uh, but do you, do you notice, it is a separate section. And, and God is saying, look, I, I want your heart to be wholly devoted to me. And I want you to be filled with Christ. And I want you to be living for God. And if you do that, you won't sin. But if you do sin, <laughs> you see, it's almost like in an underbreath, God says, if you do sin, then, then I've made a way for that too. I've made a way. And of course, what's the answer? Well, it's Christ. <laughs> it's Christ again. Because Christ is our sin offering, and Christ is our trespass offering, using the, the old language terms for that. Um, and there's two sides to sin in these chapters. It's chapter 4 and 5, um, goes to 6, 7 uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, in the English Bible, uh, but the Hebrew uh, starts, uh, you know, different verses. Um, there's two aspects to sin that God has to deal with. And the one aspect is, if you like, the legal aspect. Uh, when we sin, we break God's law. And you and I will stand before the court of God for our sin. Every idle word. We stand before God because of our sin. Um, so if you imagine um, some teenage lad, I was going to say in Swansea, because this is where the highest incidence of car crime is, uh, steals a car and he races down the high street in the car and... Uh, he, 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 he breaks the law because he goes over 30 miles an hour down the high street. And the police catch him and he's speeding at 60 miles an hour down the high street. And he's broken the law. You see, that's sin. But there's another side to sin. He'll answer for that because he's broken the law. But imagine that this boy, because he was a young driver, he swerved around the corner and went over the curve and he killed a five-year-old child. Imagine that. Do you see, it's, it's part of what sin is, isn't it? But it's something different, isn't it? It's the damage that sin causes. It's damage in relation to society. Damage in relation to God. Damage in relation to the mother. Of course, damage in relation to the child. How do you solve that problem? That the damage that sin causes... 
And that's the purpose of the second offering. It's called the trespass offering or guilt offering sometimes. When you and I sin, we have a massive guilt on us. Not just because we've broken God's law, but because of the damage we've done. Because of our sin. And you and I know what damage we've caused in our lives, in relationships, in our family, and in society. And God wants to resolve that. He wants to repay that damage back. And that's what the trespass offering is. So Christ is our sin offering. He deals with uh, the, the stain of sin, the dirt of sin, and he cleanses sin in relationship with God. That's the sin offering. And God, through Christ, deals with the, the guilt of sin and the damage of sin. And he repays that. And uh, you and I, amazingly, uh, when we bring Christ as our sin offering, uh, God forgives us and he cleanses us from the dirt and the stain of sin. And he cleanses us too from the guilt and the damage. What a wonderful thing this is, that it's only Christ and it's only through his atoning work. Can anyone in the world know forgiveness like this? There is no religion in the world that forgives sin. It's only Christ forgives <coughs> sin. Isn't that amazing? And he deals with sin and the damage because of sin. But uh, just briefly, I want to try and say something about this that's maybe a bit sensitive. Um, when, when, when we come with our sin to God, and I, I don't want to downplay this. Uh, you know, all of us are sinners. All of us make mistakes against the holy God. And all of us need to face up to sin. And if you read carefully these chapters, chapter um, 4, about what you do with sin, the sinner is made to feel the weight of the sin in the whole process. And uh, that, that sin stains the root to God. It stains the way to him, the relationship, and it needs to be cleansed. And as I said, it, it causes damage as well. And so when you and I come, and we, we do come with sin, uh, what, what do we do with this? And I, I found this very helpful, because this I've got from the offerings. When, when they brought the sin offering, they confessed their sin on the head of the animal. They actually put their hand on the head, and they, they confessed their sin on the head of the animal. Well, who's the animal? Who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Not just my sin, the sin of the world. It's Christ, isn't it? And when you come, what, what are you bringing? You bring, you lay your hands on Christ. And can you, in your heart of hearts, feel this? That I'm, I'm laying my sin on the head of Christ. The one who died on the cross for my sin. And the implications of this for me. And the effect that it has on me. If genuinely I come and I lay my hand on the head of Christ, my Saviour, who died on a cross for my sin. Lay my hand on him. I confess the sin. But who is the, who is the one who dies because of my sin? Who is the one whose blood goes in to the presence of God and cleanses the way? because of my sin. And who is that the one who, in, in the animal itself, was taken outside the camp and was burnt and destroyed? Because God hates sin. And God wants to destroy sin. And so he, he doesn't play around with sin and keep it around. He gets rid of it completely. All this is strong picture to me, strong metaphor to me, of what Christ has done as my sin offering. And so when I come, I'm not obsessing over my sin. I'm filling my heart with Christ. 
who is my sin offering. And there's a massive difference between those two things. So when I come, I'm not filling my heart with my sin. I'm filling my heart with Christ as my sin offering. I think it makes a world of a difference to the way we worship, and the way we deal with our sin. And so please do face up to sin and do bring Christ as your sin offering. And if we sin, John says, and he quotes the same words from Leviticus, if you sin, what do you do then? If you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so you and I can come and confess our sins. And he is faithful and just, the Bible says, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's the above unit, and the, the low unit, and the middle unit, and uh, time is going. Uh, I'll just have to deal with the next two sections in a few sentences, uh, but you can read about it in the paper uh, if you wish. So that's the court. The second section is about the holy place, and this is about priests. Uh, those who come near to God are called priests. So we're worshippers when we bring our offerings, but actually as we go on into the tabernacle, we become priests. And that happens in chapter 8 and 9, and we read about that. And uh, the amazing thing is God has made us a kingdom of priests. And this is dramatic language, and it's taken out of the book of Leviticus. Uh, we're not meant to be um, uh, um, pew sitters in, in a spiritual sense. We're meant to be God's kingdom of priests. And so this whole section deals with how do, we, how do, how do you make this kingdom of priests? And uh, chapters 8 and 9 and 10 deal with that particularly, uh, the above units. And then uh, the, the middle unit deals with what we feed on as priests. And the lower unit is uh, the uh, childbirth, human birth. How do we bring uh, uh, people into the world that are becoming this kingdom of priests? Uh, the middle section deals with what we eat. And uh, Jews are, are distinguished by this today. It's called kosher food, of course. And it's in that section there, chapter 11 of Leviticus. What is kosher food for a Christian? <laughs> kosher food for a Christian. Do you care what you eat? Well, we all know, don't we, the sentence, you are what you eat. <coughs> but do we mean whether I'm eating baked beans or fish and chips or what? No, we're talking about what do we feed our souls on? And you could feed your souls on one thing, can't you? And destroy yourself. Or you could feed your souls on Christ. And you can become more and more like him. So you are what you eat. And if you want to be a priest for God, you have to eat the right stuff, which is what that chapter is on about. And then uh, the, the third section is the Holy of Holies. And uh, so much here. Uh, but the big, the above unit here is the Day of Atonement. And for the first time in the book, Aaron the priest goes in through that veil and into the very Holy of Holies. Uh, the clue is in the name the Holy of Holies. It's the holiest place of all, and it's the presence of God. And he goes in there, what with? Well, with Christ, with a, a sin offering, in effect. And it deals with, it says, it deals with all the sin and all the iniquities and all the transgressions of the nation. And it's a picture, of course, of the cross of Christ. How can any one of us hope to enter into the holiest presence of God all. It's through Christ and through his atoning work. An amazing chapter, an amazing theology, and a big theology. And uh, in the middle section there is this one verse which uh, is key to the whole piece. And it's the verse that says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you on the altar to atone for your souls. It's a strange verse, and quite a dramatic verse, 
And it, it's saying, again, in effect, that blood is a metaphor. The life, it's the word nephesh, the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And if you ever drain the blood of an animal, you see the life going out of it. The ancients would have understood this. The blood is a picture of the life draining out. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you as, as a symbol, as a picture uh, for atonement. That, that blood of the animal isn't anything in itself intrinsically. But God had made this choice, that this amazing metaphor, this life blood that drains from an animal is going to become a symbol to people, his ancient people, of the way they could get atonement through an innocent, um, unblemished sacrifice. They could know atonement, forgiveness, right with God. And uh, you and I know that that's not possible through an animal. Not all the blood of bulls and goats uh, can, can do this. It can only be through the servant of the Lord that Isaiah 53 talks about. And Christ was made that sin offering, uh, that trespass offering, that day of atonement for us. And through his death, you and I can become right with God. At one with God through his atoning work. Amazing. And we've got to the Holy of Holies. And you and I can stand in God's presence. The veil is gone. And you and I can come here and we can worship him. And we hear his voice say to us, be holy. Because I am holy. What an awesome place this is. We'll learn a bit more about that in our fifth session. Uh, but let's close in prayer, shall we? And uh, thank God. Father, we thank you for this uh, amazing book that uh, seems so obscure to us in our 21st century. Uh, but we realize that they were, they were ancient pictures which would have had deep meaning to ancient people, but also uh, so much richer for us now that we've come to see that your fulfillment is in Yeshua. It's in Jesus, our Savior. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into our world, for giving your life in your life, in your thoughts and words and deeds, in everything you said and did for the glory of your Father. And then going to the cross, step by step, taking that journey, setting your face like a flint to go to Jerusalem, determined to fulfill the Father's will, determined to bring about our salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to that cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking upon your body our sin and my sin. And I give you my life today. I surrender myself to you and pray that you will fill me with your spirit and give me your holiness to fill my soul and for my life, life to be a shining light for you that others might taste and see that the Lord is good. We pray this, Lord Jesus, for the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.